Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Global Atheist News Roundup, dateline the 28th of July. I'm sorry, we're a day late. This week's headlines. Palestinian preacher vows to conquer Europe by imposing Islam. About 200 were arrested in the Canon Rotunda for protesting the Gaza war. Oklahoma superintendent rejects the Bibles in Schools initiative despite Ryan Waters' demands. In New Zealand, the Prime Minister says it's a national disgrace in his responses to the Abuse in Care Inquiry's final report. A Hindu opening prayer is to open the US Senate again on July the 30th. Reserved seats for bishops were questioned in the Lord's Constitution debate in London. An Afghanistan holiday for anyone? Here is the news in detail. A Palestinian preacher vowed to conquer Europe and ethnocide Christian nations by imposing Islam. Soon we will conquer Paris and Rome, rule Europe with Islam. Muslims are furious and Allah is offended by the Western world where women are prostitutes and men are gays. The only solution is to conquer the West and impose Islam. These are the Western countries, including the US, UK, Canada, Australia, Germany and France, who donate billions of dollars as foreign aid to the Palestinians every year. See this video. In France, حضارة إلحاد وكفر فهم يكرهون دين الله الحق دين التوحيد حضارتهم حضارة عهر وفجور وشذوذ لهذا فهم يحقدون على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا مكرون الزم حدك يا مكرون الزم حدك بالجهاد نهدم مجدك بالجهاد نهدم مجدك يا مكرون يا خسيس يا مكرون يا خسيس بكرة رح نفتح باريس بكرة رح نفتح باريس من المسجد الأقصى نقول لمكرون عدو الله ورسوله أبشر يا عدو الله ورسوله بالذي يسوءك نحن على موعد مع خلافة راشدة على منهج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم تتحرك جحافلها بالتكبير والتهليل لاجتياح فرنسا وفتح روما لتقيم فيها العدل وتنشر النور في جنباتها قريبا يا مكرون لنزيلن حضارتكم الفاسدة ولنطهرن الأرض من رجس رأس ماليتكم قريبا بإذن الله نحكمكم بعدل الإسلام وحضارته العظيمة ليدرك أهل أوروبا كم كانوا مخدوعين بالثورة الفرنسية إن الرد على فرنسا ورئيسها لا يكون إلا بإعلان الجهاد في سبيل الله U.S. Capitol Police arrested around 200 people protesting U.S. weapons sales to Israel inside the rotunda of the Cannon House office building on Tuesday afternoon, just a day before Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was scheduled to speak to Congress. The protest, organized by Jewish Voice for Peace, a national Jewish anti-Zionist organization, including rabbis, students, Israeli-Americans and descendants of Holocaust survivors. The group is horrified and dismayed that elected officials will meet with Netanyahu, said Sonia Mayerson-Knox, a group spokeswoman. 
Inside the building at about 3 p.m., hundreds of protesters sang Let Gaza Live and Stop Genocide and sat in a circle around a banner that read No one is free until everyone is free. They wore red shirts that read Jews say, stop arming Israel, and they clapped as they sang, not in our name. After about 20 minutes, Capitol Police told protesters to stop demonstrating. While some protesters left, many remained. About 10 minutes later, officers then began clearing the area, using zip ties to remove protesters from the rotunda. As we reported a couple of weeks ago, Oklahoma's Superintendent of Public Instruction, Ryan Waters, a proud Christian nationalist, announced that he would soon force teachers across the state to use the Bible in their classrooms. The Bible is a necessary historical document to teach our kids about the history of this country, Waters told the State Board of Education last month. Therefore, he went on, every teacher, every classroom in the state will have a Bible in the classroom and will be teaching from the Bible in the classroom. He said the Bible would be referenced for, among other things, its substantial influence on our nation's founders and the foundational principles of our Constitution. He added, adherence to this mandate is compulsory, immediate, and strict compliance is expected. Church-state separation groups said they would take action if needed because Waters' memo was nothing more than that. There was no law in place forcing teachers to listen to him. There was no enforcement mechanism. Even the, officer, even the office of the state's attorney general said that Bibles were already permitted in schools and allowed in instruction, suggesting, very mildly, that Walter's memo was pointless. With the new school year beginning in a few weeks, Nick Migliorino, superintendent of the Norman Public Schools, which serves over 15,000 students, said in an interview that his district won't be participating in this charade. In New Zealand, the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Abuse in Care report has been published. It features Lake Alice, a psychiatric hospital that was closed in 1999. Lake Alice was named after the daughter of the landowner, farmer Jack Waters, who helped to bring Jehovah's Witnessing to New Zealand. Former patients of the hospital's child and as adolescent unit made allegations that abuse took place there during the 1970s, including the use of electroconvulsive therapy without anaesthetic and peraldehyde injections as punishment. The New Zealand government issued a written apology in 2001 and has paid out a total of 10.7 million New Zealand dollars in compensation to a smaller group of 183 former patients, but refused to acknowledge and offer redress for the long-term effects of physical, sexual and psychological abuse and torture. This forced applications to the UN Committee Against Torture in 2019. After six years and many delays, the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Abuse in Care has released its findings in a 3,000-page, 16-part report into the abuse and neglect of an estimated 113,000 to 253,000 children, young people and adults at state and faith-based care facilities in Aotearoa between 1950 and 1999. Prime Minister Luxon says this is a dark and sorrowful day in New Zealand's history. It is important that, as a country, we bring to the surface and understand the hard truths of what happened so we can try and move together forward. I say to the survivors, 
The burden is no longer yours to carry alone. The state is now standing here beside you, accountable and ready to take action. Hindu statesman Rajan Z, who read the invocation in the United States Senate in Washington, D.C. on July the 12th, 2007, which was protested and disrupted, has been scheduled to deliver the opening prayer again in the Senate on July the 30th. During Rajan Z's 2007 Hindu Senate prayer, law enforcement officers removed the protesters from the visitor's gallery so that he could finish his invocation. Z plans to start and end the July 30th prayer on the, on the prayer of the Senate with Om, the mystical syllable containing the universe, which in Hinduism is used to introduce and conclude religious work. Prayer will contain hymns from the world's oldest extant scripture. Rajan Z will read the English interpretation of the original Sanskrit verses from Rig Veda, the oldest scripture in the world still in common use, besides lines from Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita, Song of the Lord, both ancient Hindu sculptures. Instructions to Senate guest chaplains clearly state that the opening prayer must be given exclusively and entirely in the English language. Reserved seats for Church of England bishops in the House of Lords have been questioned in a debate on constitutional reform. 26 Anglican bishops sit by right in the Lords. The debate comes as the government announces plans to remove hereditary peers and impose age limits in the Lords. Liberal Democrat peer Paul Scriven, who also introduced a, bit, a bill to disestablish the Church of England last year, said, in a modern democracy, no religious organisation should be guaranteed seats in a parliament. He noted that the Church of England is the only institution in the whole country that is guaranteed seats in Parliament and said it is now time to end the automatic rights of a particular church to parliamentary seats. Crossbench peer Norman Warner emphasised his commitment to removing the bishops. Apart from theocracies such as Iran, there are no other parliaments where clerics have a right of representation, he said. He noted the dwindling of Church of, Church of England attendance rates, which he described as shrinking faster than the volume of letters delivered by the Royal Mail. Conservative peer Richard Keane said the bishop's bench was more anomalous and perhaps more in need of reform than hereditary peers. He noted that bishops representing the Church of England are entitled to automatic seats, whereas peers representing churches from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland do not enjoy the same right. The Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, said he wanted to focus on rebuilding trust in democracy, but he went on to defend ex officio seats for Church of England bishops. We on these benches value our particular role as Lord's spiritual, he said. Conservative peer Douglas Hodd said, There is scope for reducing the size of the Episcopal bench. He proposed decreasing the number of bishops from 26 to 5. That would be quite sufficient, he said. See this video. I also want to emphasise my commitment to the idea of removing the bishops. They are as much an anomaly as hereditary peers. And I think Lord Keane has done a service to us in seeming to actually support that view, that they should join the hereditary peers at the exit. My Lords, we are a secular society as censuses and the British Social Attitude Surveys have shown for some time. 
Anglican church attendance is shrinking faster than the volume of letters delivered by the Royal Mail. <laughs> and it largely consists, in terms of its congregations, of people over 60s. Apart from theocracies like Iran, there are no other parliaments where clerics have a right of representation. So when it comes to planning a holiday, Afghanistan is not the top of most people's must-visit lists. Decades of conflict mean that few tourists dared step foot in the Central Asian nation since its heyday as part of the hippie trail in the 1970s. And the future of whatever tourism industry had survived was thrust into further uncertainty by the Taliban's return to power in 2021. But a quick scroll through social media suggests that not only has tourism survived, it has, in its own extraordinarily niche way, boomed. Five reasons why Afghanistan should be your next trip. Gush, the delighted influencers, their cameras sweeping across glistening lakes, through mountainous passes and into colourful busy markets. Afghanistan hasn't been this safe in 20 years, tourists declare, posing next to the vast chasms left behind by the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas more than 20 years ago. It's very ironic to see those videos on TikTok where there is a Taliban guide and a Taliban official giving tickets to tourists to visit the site of the destruction of the Buddhas, points out Dr. Farkhonde Akbari, whose family fled Afghanistan during the first Taliban regime in the 1990s. These are the people who destroyed the Buddhas. Apart from Global Atheist News, Freethought Productions is taking a two-week summer break, so there will be no Freethought Hour chat show for the next two Saturdays and no Views on the News panel show. Tercia and I will be back with you after the Olympics. This has been Global Atheist News. Please like, subscribe and share. Thank you for watching.